we're so happy this morning to have as our guest minister, Brother Jason Stidham. I've known Jason for several years. He preaches here for about the last seven or eight years, one Sunday every single year. He is an evangelist in the Assemblies of God based out of Fort Worth, Texas. And when the service is over, we'll be receiving an offering for him. So please take that to heart. And we want to bless the man of God. We don't really applaud individuals. It's really not proper to applaud the individual. But we do applaud the consecration and the Christ in the person. So would you give a great big hand clap of praise to the Christ that lives in Brother Jason's heart as he comes to minister for us. Well, good morning. Greetings from the great state of Texas. He said, I'm from Texas. As far as Texans are concerned, there is nowhere else to be from. We believe that in Texas. It's always great to be here in Baton Rouge to grace this wonderful pulpit and platform. Let me say thank you to Pastor Gabe and Pastor Donnie, not only for their friendship, but for their confidence in extending another invitation to our ministry. I want to keep the preliminary remarks very brief this morning because I have a significant amount of content that I want to cover. But just prior to launching into the content, it wasn't long ago that one of my friends and mentors, Pastor Bobby Johnson, the great pastor of First Assembly of God in Van Buren, Arkansas, was suddenly taken from this world. He exited uh, his treadmill and his heart stopped. And he left this world. And I made a determination in that tragic event that I would never allow an opportunity to go by where words were left unspoken, where honor is left unbestowed, and where love is left ungiven. So can I take just a moment and say today to the great man and woman of this house, I honor you, I love you, thank you for your faithfulness and ministry, I appreciate you today, appreciate you today, thank you. Acts chapter 8 in your Bibles, while you're turning there, I wish that Tasha and Hagen and Addison could have ventured south with me, they were here for Easter camp meeting, but tomorrow they go back to school, now we homeschool our children. Now, it's kind of an adventure between Addison and her mother. They clash big time. So much so that recently Tasha was in her room, in Addison's room, cleaning and doing some work, and there's, there's a board behind her door that you can't see unless you close the door where she pins things up, artwork and various things. So Tasha finds a letter that Addison has written to the Lord. And the letter reads as follows. It says, Heavenly Father, forgive me for arguing with my mother. Help us to get along during homeschool. Then it has this line. I do not want Satan to come and get me. Now, you got to understand, in the context of this story, we're talking about a homeschooled child, and this is the way she spelt Satan, S-A-N-T-A. <laughs> she has the fear of the Lord. The education is a work in progress. <laughs> Acts chapter 8, one verse, that being the first. Acts 8 and 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Take note of that latter portion. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except 
the apostles. Now, I want to use this one word for my subject matter this morning, persecution. Stay with me. It's going to be rough for a while. I'll just tell you that up front. I believe the modern American church stands at the brink of revival. I've traveled the nation now extensively for almost 20 years. All of the ingredients are present in America except one. Because as I read the New Testament pattern, revival and persecution are inseparable. It's all throughout the book of Acts. Persecution and Pentecost go hand in hand. Understand, revival is taking place on planet Earth. There are many nations of the world that are seeing revival in biblical proportions. And America stands at the brink. We just need one ingredient added to the mix. Persecution. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We need you, Lord, today. We need you every time that we grace this sovereign office that you've called us to. Again, as I have so many times, I ask you for clarity of thought and conciseness of speech. I ask, Lord, that you captivate the audience, that we not be distracted by yesterday's concerns or tomorrow's affairs. And I ask that at the conclusion of this message, as men and women flood these altars, let us find that Pentecost is more than songs we sing, more than prayers we pray, more than sermons we preach, but let us discover once again there is a reality in the Holy Spirit. Let that reality be made manifest to us today. And everyone said, Amen. The latest statistic that I have found in my studies states that some 11% of the world's Christian population calls the United States home. Think about that. Of the world's Christian constituency, only 11%, and I actually believe the number is lower than that, is found housed inside the borders of America. What does that statistic tell us? Well, it tells us many things. The thing I want to emphasize to you is this. With only 11% of the church being found in America, it tells us that if all we see is the American church, we have a very skewed view of what the church of the Lord Jesus Christ really is. A very skewed view. And much of what Christianity is impacted by worldwide, we have been shielded from here in this nation. But I want you to see the biblical concept of persecution. Number one, I want you to realize with me this morning that according to the Bible, persecution was promised. I love to preach this message and I love to preach this first point and watch the response or rather the lack thereof. Because if I had mentioned any other promise found in this book, you would have responded radically different. If I had told you the book promises salvation, the book promises divine healing, the book promises prosperity, the book promises joy unspeakable and full of glory, the book promises peace that surpasses all understanding, the book promises the mighty baptism in the Holy Spirit, you would have responded radically different. But can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? The same book that promised all of that is the same book that promises persecution to the saints of God as well. Jesus said it. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, remember the word that I've spoken to you. The servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will surely persecute you. 
Jesus said, blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Paul writes to his spiritual son, Timothy, in 2 Timothy and says, yes, and all, A-double-L, all, I think you fall into that category, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why do I drive this point home as I build a foundation? Because I want you to realize as an American Christian, you're not exempt. There is no spiritual place of maturity that we can ascend to that somehow makes us exempt from persecution. Persecution is a biblical pattern for all believers to experience. Hear me this morning before I move on to my second point. A church and or believer that does nothing for God will face no persecution. A church and or believer that does little for God will face little persecution. But a church and or believer that does much for God will surely face much persecution. Persecution is promised. Number two, not only is persecution promised, but I want you to see with me this morning that persecution is present. It was prophesied of old by Jesus, but it is now present in this world. They're going to help me today as I have provided them a number of photographs. If they'll give me the first one on the screen, I want to take you first this morning to the underground church. I want to take you away from what we know as the 11 percentile of Christians here in America and take you to where the 89% reside, many of them. Many people right now around this planet cannot openly congregate and worship the Lord in freedom as you and I are doing here this morning. If their faith in Christ becomes public knowledge, the least, the least they would experience is they would be exiled by their family, fired from their place of employment, and would live their life as a reject in society. That's the least they would experience. There are multiplied millions of believers that if their faith becomes public knowledge, they will be beaten. They will be incarcerated. There are still multiplied millions of believers that live in other nations of the world that if their faith becomes public knowledge, they will face certain execution. Now, I told you a moment ago, the early portion of this sermon is going to be very difficult to process. But I have found it a necessity because I have found that the American church has lost touch with reality. And I can tell you that in my understanding and processing of these scriptures and this information, it has radically transformed my delivery as a preacher of the gospel. Let me just go ahead and say it. It might be my last time to get to say it here, but let me say it while I'm on international television. I've had it up to here with American Christianity. I've had it. I've had it up to here with with chasing around and pandering after. Understand something with me. Thank God that you're here this morning. Thank God for your presence here on these pews. But look around at all of the vacant seats. And understand that there are many believers that could have been in this house of God today, but they chose to be elsewhere because they had a golf ball that needed to be. They had a fish that needed to be. Hello. They had a ball game that needed their attention. And can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that while there are many vacant seats here, there are multiplied millions of believers around the world that would give anything. I said they would give anything if they could pack these pews to capacity. They would be here today front and center with a passion if they were allowed to be. And yet we pander. Come on. 
I said, yet we pander week in and week out. Oh, you babies, we don't want to offend you. Oh, bless your heart. We don't want to say anything to get you upset. Please come to church on Sunday night. Please come to church on Wednesday night. Please give in the offering. That stuff makes me sick to my stomach. Come on, saints. I said, it makes me sick to my stomach. Get a good look on that monitor again. Look at that third world church and recognize the God of the American that we pander after is the same God and one day we're going to give an account for what we call Christianity in America. Persecution is present. Not only do you have the underground church, but number two, you've got ISIS. Give me that second slide if you will, please. The Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, though the current administration has definitely cut down on the progress that they're making, do you realize that they're, regardless of what the former administration said, there is a genocide taking place on this planet where people of faith are systematically targeted and eliminated. Women are raped and ravaged consumed and then executed. Men have their heads lopped off on public television. Children are herded like cattle into cages where a fuel source is poured all over them and then their bodies are ignited while an audience stands back and watches. And what is their crime? Their crime is this. They belong to Jesus Christ. Persecution is present in this modern world. Number three in the headlines, even this morning, give me that next photo if you will, please. The American pastor, Andrew Brunson, who even now, as I speak, is still a prisoner in the country of Turkey. The front page of the Wall Street Journal this morning talking about President Trump and the Turkish president and the confrontation over the release of this man. What is his crime? He's a Christian. Persecution is present in this world, ladies and gentlemen. Lest you think all of the persecution against Christianity is found outside the borders of the United States, give me the next slide, if you will, please. Remember this lady? It's Kim Davis. Rowan County, Kentucky. She's the county clerk. Kim Davis says, I cannot issue a marriage license to two men or two women because it violates my Christian value system. She goes before United States Judge David Bunning. David Bunning said, you're in contempt of your office. We're going to lock you up, not for 30 days, not for 60 days, not for 90 days. He said, we're going to lock you up for an indetermined period of time. We don't know when we'll let you out. That's right here in the good old United States of America. Lest you think all of that is taking place in the past political administration, can I tell you in the news this week, evangelist Greg Laurie had all of his billboards pulled down for a gospel crusade in Southern California. Because there was a picture of the Bible on the billboard. It didn't say Bible on the book. It didn't even have a cross. The man is holding a black book in his hand, and they went crazy over it. Persecution is present. I said persecution is present against Christianity. And it's only going to continue to advance. I've got another photo, but we're going to skip it and move on. Persecution is present. Persecution was promised. Number three, persecution is permitted by God. It's permitted by God. Permitted for a purpose, as we'll see momentarily. I want you to take your Bible and move through the book of Acts with me quickly, if you would. Let's begin first in Acts chapter 4. I'm talking about the progression of persecution. I want to show you that persecution progresses in various stages according to the biblical pattern. 
Acts chapter 4. Now, Acts chapter 4 sequentially, of course, follows on the heels of Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 sees Peter and John going to the temple. They find a lame man by the gate, beautiful. They pray for him. A miracle transpires and revival begins to break out there in Jerusalem. This is the response to revival. Understand, revival and persecution always go hand in hand. You don't have one without the other. Verse 4, or chapter 4, rather, verse 1. And as they spoke unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day. Verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go. Stage one of the progression of persecution is the threatening stage. America is in stage one of persecution. They are now threatening believers with great regularity. Acts chapter 5, let's look at stage 2. Acts 5, again, we're going to see in the 12th and 13th and 14th verse that revival is happening. People are being saved by the scores, the miraculous, the healings. And verse 17 records the result of revival springing forth. Then the high priest rose up, and all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Let me say this. The coming persecution to America will no doubt take wings politically. It's going to come through the secular government and other secular means. But I believe here we find that the greatest persecution that will come against the move of God will come from the church. It will come from the religious institution. The religious institution cannot stand a move of God because a move of God releases the people from the control of the religious entity. You see, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the rulers of the time of Christ, they knew who Jesus was. They knew the Scriptures. They knew the Old Testament prophecies. They knew He was the Son of God. But they came to the conclusion, we had rather see you dead than lose control of these people. They're filled with indignation. Verse 18, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. First they threaten us, then they begin to lock us up. Verse 40, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. First they threaten us, then they lock us up, then they begin to beat us. That's all in your B-I-B-L-E, folks. It's in your Bible. This is the pattern. Acts chapter 7, look there with me quickly. Acts 7, verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, saw the glory of God, Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him with one accord, cast him out, into, uh, out of the city and stoned him. And verse 59, and they stone Stephen calling upon God. First they threaten us, then they lock us up, then they physically assault us. Now they begin to execute us. Verse 8, our chief text, there was great persecution against the church, or chapter 8, verse 1, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad. Now notice the final stage here in chapter 9, verse 1, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Notice, when persecution first first started, it was just the apostles. It was just a select few. But by the time it progresses to its fullest extent in the ninth chapter of Acts, it's if we find any Christian anywhere. You see, it might be a baker in California now. It might be a billboard here or there, but make no mistake, when it progresses to its fullest extent, they're coming after us all. 
persecution progresses. Fourth, there's a peril associated with persecution. Why is all of this important? Why do I need to understand this, evangelist? Why is this applicable to me here on Sunday morning? Because there's a peril associated with the coming persecution. Jesus is speaking in Matthew's gospel about the various kinds of soil that would receive the seed. Jesus said the stony ground that receives the seed is like the man who receives the gospel at first with great joy. Great joy to be a Christian. But he only endures for a while, Jesus said. You see, I'm convinced there are scores of believers in America's church that are serving God currently with great joy, but they're only going to endure for a while. Jesus goes on to say, because they have no root. They have no root in themselves. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that if the last presidential election had gone the other way, it is my personal belief that the persecution that I, persecution that I believe is coming to America would have come upon us exponentially. However, we have been given a space of grace I don't believe the election of Donald J. Trump is going to stop persecution from coming because revival's coming to America, and with revival will come persecution. But we've been given a space of grace. Why a space of grace? Because God knows the average American Christian has no root. Has no root. He endures for a while, he has no root in himself. And then he goes on to say, by and by, when persecution comes, that's what the book says, when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, he will be offended. Can I tell you right now, it doesn't cost you anything to be an American Christian. I said, does it cost you anything to be an American Christian? But very soon, the climate's going to change. Can I tell you that one day, the political pendulum will swing back the other way? And when it does, I'm convinced that all hell is going to break loose. And all of a sudden, it's going to cost you something to say, two men ought not be married together. Two women ought not be living together. Let me give you this. A man and a woman ought not live together unless they be married. It's going to begin to cost us something to stand up for our Christian values. And when the price tag comes along, there are going to be many joyous believers that are going to say, I don't want to pay that. They will become offended at this word and offended at the name of Jesus. And here's the peril of persecution. If you don't prepare for the coming persecution before persecution arrives, you've waited too long. If you wait until the policeman's knocking on your door to make up your decision, I can tell you you waited too late. We have to get root in the ground now. I said we have to get root in the ground now to withstand the coming persecution. All right, now let's shift gears. How do I overcome the peril of persecution? How do I overcome? Three ways. Number one, we must learn how to pray like the persecuted church prays. We must learn how to pray like the persecuted church prays. You see, in America, prayer is optional. Some of you, when you go to lunch following this service, you won't be able to bow your head in a public restaurant and pray over the noon meal because what would somebody think? I'll just pray quietly, inwardly. See, prayer is optional. But can I tell you for the 
for the persecuted church that abides in other countries of the world, prayer's not optional, prayer's a necessity. If they're going to make it, they've got to pray to make it. Acts chapter 5, turn there with me again. Rather, Acts chapter 4 first. Acts 4, let's look at the way the persecuted church prays. Praying like the persecuted church. Acts 4, verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom you have anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken when they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke the Word of God with boldness. Ladies and gentlemen, very soon the days are going to come upon us when prayer is no longer going to be optional for us. It's going to become a necessity for our survival. But I'm thankful that you and I, even this morning, right now, we have an opportunity to get some good practice in. Let's begin to practice praying like the person saints pray. Why don't you throw your hands up toward heaven? Why don't you open your mouth? Why don't you vocally begin to proclaim and talk to the Lord? Father, would you look down upon us here in the United States of America? Would you look down upon your church? Would you forgive us of our immaturity and our carnality? And would you help us, O oh Lord, to become a spiritual group of people that grow deep roots in the spiritual foundation of Christ and him crucified and Lord behold their threatenings look at the persecution that is coming upon us but engraft into these people a spine of steel that we will not waver we will not falter we will not fail and Lord accompany our faithfulness with signs and wonders and miracles that the name of Jesus would be glorified come Holy Spirit we need you. We need you. We need you today. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. We got to learn how to pray like the persecuted saints of God pray. Not only must we pray like the persecuted saints of God pray to overcome the peril of persecution, but number two, we must learn how to praise like the persecuted church. I said we must learn how to praise like the persecuted church. You see, you've got some of the finest musical talent and the greatest anointing in the world here on this platform. And yet with all of that, I looked out and scanned the audience this morning. And with all of this, some of you still can't praise God. I mean, Brother Swaggart is now 80 plus years of age and he's got to get out here and turn cartwheels to get some of you to do anything. Hello. You see, for Americans, praise is optional. We praise God if we feel like it. We don't praise God if we don't feel like it. But for the persecuted church, praise is not optional. Praise is a necessity in order for them to survive. They must praise God. Look at Acts chapter 5. I'm going to go ahead and just confess that I'm not living here, but I want to live here. I mean, this is, this is mind-blowing information. 
Acts 5, verse 40. I read it to you a moment ago, but I read it again to set the context for the 41st verse. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. Hallelujah. I said they departed praising God. I can tell you Stidham's not that sanctified. I mean, that's one verse removed from a horrific beating. Maybe I could have rejoiced five or six chapters later after my body had, had time to heal up and I had had time to pray through. Maybe I could have rejoiced. But this group of early Christians was able to rejoice one verse removed. Why were they rejoicing? That they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Can I tell you the day's coming in America where you're not going to have all this. You're not going to have all the talent and all the choir and all the musicians and all the singers to lead you into praise before the presence of God. You're going to have some hard days. You're going to have some midnight experiences like Paul and Silas locked up, beaten, suffering for the cause of Christ. And you and I have to learn now that we don't need all of this. This is wonderful, but we don't need all of this. You can beat me. You can lock me up, but yet I'm going to praise the name of the Lord that I was counted worthy to suffer shame for his cause. Hallelujah. Hear me, saints of God. The same thing that the persecuted church has, the same thing that the 89% around the world have, you and I have it. This ability to pray is in us. This ability to praise is in us. You see, all we need is some persecution to come along and squeeze it on up out of us. Oh, it's there. It just needs the trigger point to be released. Let me read an excerpt from a letter for you this morning. This comes from 19 and 11. Guys, if you have that black and white photo, would you give it to me, please? This gentleman here on the screen now is F.F. Bosworth. He was a Pentecostal founder at the turn of the century. He helped to found Dallas First Assembly of God Church that I preach in almost every year. My good friend, Pastor Daniel Enriquez, is the bishop of that house now. And I want to read to you a letter written by Bosworth. I'm talking about learning how to praise like the persecuted church. This letter is written by Bosworth to his mother describing a, a horrific beating that he would undergo following one of his crusades. Now, this was his crime. He preached at a campground where there were two tents. In one tent were all of the white people, and in the other tent were all of the black people. They weren't even under the same tent. But because he dared preach to both blacks and whites simultaneously, he would undergo this beating. Talking about praising God like the persecuted church. August the 21st, 1911, Bosworth writes, Dear Mother and all, we were so glad to get yours, Bert's, and Bertha's letters this morning and will answer at once to save you the unnecessary worry about me. When I wrote you from Calvert on my way home from Hearn, Texas, I started a letter telling you all about the mobbing and then thinking how it might worry you I tore up the first letter and wrote you the other one, not mentioning the pounding that I got. He goes on and begins to lay context for what happened. Some gentlemen approached them. They pulled a pistol. They were going to shoot them. I now quote again. He says, with this explanation, they decided not to kill, but insisted that we should take the next train. So we went to the depot, and I bought my ticket to Dallas, and the other brother went to his room for his suitcase. 
And while he was gone and I was waiting for my train, a larger mob of about 25 took me from the depot and knocked me down, pounded me with heavy hardwood clubs with all of their power, cursing and declaring that I would never preach again when they were through with me. As they pounded me with these heavy clubs made from the oar of a boat, I offered no resistance but committed myself to God and asked him not to let the blows break my spine. God stood wonderfully by me, and no bones were broken except a slight fracture in my left wrist. When they left off pounding me with the clubs, as I got up, others of the mob who had no clubs began knocking me down in the, or knock, hitting me in the head rather, with their fist. I was knocked down several times, but was not for a moment unconscious, which was a miracle of God's care. I was then not allowed to take my train, but had to walk nine miles to Calvert, where I got a train Sunday at 2 p.m. for home. The suffering during the pounding was terrible, but as soon as it was over, I looked away from my wounds and bruises to God, and he took away all the suffering and put his power and strength upon me so that I carried a heavy suitcase with my right arm for over nine miles. Some people couldn't blocks to church today. Come on, saints. I'm talking about the praise of the persecuted. I never had the slightest anger or ill feelings toward those men who beat me so cruel. And the walk to Calvert in the dark moonlight was the most heavenly experience of my life. And the Lord gave me wonderful intercession for those men that he should forgive them and prepare them for his coming. My flesh was smashed to the bone, uh, uh, on my back to the bone, down nearly to my knees. But since the beating, I have been free from all suffering. Others have been made nervous and have broken down and wept when they were shown the wounds on my body. But I have been absolutely free from nervousness. No fear, not even tired. He has been so precious to me. You want to know why I've had it up to here with American Christians? When I read something like this, a testimony like this, preachers hear me. You preachers that are watching this telecast hear me. One day God's going to hold us accountable for people like that. We keep pandering. God's going to hold us accountable for people that have a testimony like this. He said, he was so precious to me since this event has taken place. I've thanked him many times for being privileged to know something of the fellowship of his sufferings. If this mobbing was the result of some unwise thing I had done or speaking anything but his, uh, his own sweet message, I would have been very sorry. But since it came from plain obedience in preaching his gospel to every creature, it has now given me great joy to experience something that was so common among early Christians in the first century century church he says I now feel like I am several notches higher in my Christian life <laughs> praise and prayer like the persecuted church makes us ready to overcome the peril of persecution one more point and I'm done persecution has a purpose Stay with me. Persecution has a purpose. You see, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. If God wanted to stop persecution, he could stop it like that. Come on. God could stop ISIS like that. God could stop Putin like that. God can free Andrew Brunson like that. But God allows it. He permits persecution for his purposes. Hallelujah. You see, our chief text this morning, Acts 8 and 1, says there was a great persecution against the church so that they were all scattered to Judea and Samaria. That's what Acts 8 1 says. Now, you Pentecostals here on Sunday morning, tell me what Acts 1.8 says. Acts 1.8 says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts 8.1 is the fulfillment 
at least the partial fulfillment of Acts 1-8. That might not do anything for you. That kind of stuff in the Bible turns my crank because it's not by chance. Acts 1-8 and Acts 8-1 are two sides of the same coin. You see, God is allowing his purposes to be accomplished through the vehicle of persecution. This is what transpired, if I might give you this synopsis. God promises the power in Acts 1-8. In Acts 2, we know what happened. There was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Suddenly there came a sound as a rushing mighty wind filled all the house. Cloven tongues of fire appeared upon each of them. They spoke in another tongue as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And the devil sees what's going on in Jerusalem and says, "Uh uh-oh, I've got a problem. I've got a problem. The, The fire of God has been poured out on these Christians in Jerusalem. And the devil begins to devise. The devil begins to scheme. The devil comes up with a strategy. He says, I'm going to extinguish this fire. I'm going to snuff the fire of God out. What method will I choose? He said, I'll use persecution. Hallelujah. Hang on. I'm going to use the method of persecution. But not only is God omnipotent, all-powerful, God is omniscient, all-knowing. What does that mean? It means that God knows everything. He knows the beginning before it begins. He knows the end before the conclusion arrives. And God with his omniscience knew that the devil would use the method of persecution in an attempt to extinguish the holy fire. You see, God knew Acts 4 was coming. God knew Acts 5 was coming. God knew Acts 7, the first martyr, was coming. God knew Acts 8 was coming. God knew Acts 9 was coming. So God gave us Acts 2. Some of you wonder, why do I need the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Why do I need to speak in another tongue as the Spirit of God enables me? Why do I need Acts 2? Because Acts 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9 are coming. And God says, because I know what you're going to do, before you do what you're going to do, I'm going to use my knowledge of what you're going to do before you do what you're going to do to accomplish what I want to do. Because I know what you're going to do before you do what you're going to do, I'm going to use my knowledge of such to accomplish what I want to do. He had prophesied, we're going to spread the fire. It was never God's desire that the gospel, that the fire of the Holy Spirit be contained in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So just let the devil do some of the work for you. Come on, saints. Guys, give me that, give me that last slide. Give me that last slide, if you will. Give me that picture of my oven at my home. Look at this oven. This happened to my home not long ago. We did a major remodel at our house, totally remodeled the kitchen, only to wake up a few weeks later to my wife screaming, there's a fire, there's a fire, there's a fire. House is filled with smoke. Just so happened my parents, my extended family were there. I run into the kitchen and I find that my dad and my brother have a sack of flour and they're pouring it in the bottom of this convection oven trying to, trying to put out a grease fire beneath that bottom plate. Hallelujah. You see, my dad had enough wisdom and experience in living that he knew you have to be careful what method you use extinguishing fires because if you use the wrong method you will not extinguish a fire rather you will spread the fire hallelujah I said hallelujah 
persecute the church and snuff out the fire, but he didn't realize he chose the wrong method. I said he chose the wrong method. He went into Jerusalem and he was smiting the church and he was making a martyr out of Stephen. But what he didn't realize is every time he would strike the fire, it began to jump over into Judea and then it jumped into Samaria and then he messed around and fanned it all over the globe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, saints. Listen, I'm done. Listen. Persecution is coming. This is a prophetic word from God. Persecution is coming to America. It's coming to the American church, but it's not to be feared. Let's go ahead and recognize it for what it is, and let's embrace it, and let's recognize that God uses persecution to perpetuate Pentecost. So when persecution comes and the devil strikes you, the fire of God's going to jump on your wife. It's going to jump on your husband. It's going to jump on your children. It's going to jump on your parents. Come on. It's going to jump on your co-workers. It's going to jump on your classmates. It'll jump around the city. It'll jump around the state of Louisiana. Let the, come on. Let persecution come and the will of God be done. Stand to your feet and worship God today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Come on. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your omnipotence. Thank you for your omniscience. Thank you, Lord, for your divine plan that will be carried out upon the rock, Christ Jesus. You will build your church. Hell will not stop it. Washington will not stop it. <laughs> The liberal agenda will not stop it. You will use all these things to spread the fire. Spread the fire. You're here this morning. I'm not going to ask for any uplifted hands. If you need the baptism in the Holy Spirit for the first time, if you've never received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I hope the Word of God has convinced you today. You need Acts 2 because Acts 4 is coming. Acts 5 is coming. 20 years of traveling as an evangelist, people have asked me countless times, must I have the baptism in the Holy Spirit to make it to heaven? Now that I have studied out this message and started preaching it, I've changed my answer. This is my answer. You need the baptism in the Holy Spirit to make it. Hear me. I didn't say anything about making it to heaven. I said to make it. You need the baptism in the Holy Spirit to make it from sun up to sundown. You need the baptism in the Holy Spirit to make one step to the next. You need the baptism in the Holy Spirit to make it in this life. If you're here and you have received the baptism and you realize through the preaching of the Word today, that you've been allowed to live for such a time as this. The greatest opportunity for the church in America is before us. I said it's before us. Revival's coming. And if you're ready to plant roots a little deeper in the foundation that is Christ and Him crucified, if you're ready to set yourself strong and steady for the persecution that's coming so that you can be a conduit that will propel the fire of God throughout your family, throughout your community, and throughout this world. If you fall into either of those categories, as they begin to play and sing, come on, join me in this altar. Come on, come on, come on, come on. In Jesus' name, come on. Let your living water flow. Oh, praise God. Let him feel you right there. 
When you begin to sense that stirring in the spirit man, open your mouth and release that prophetic speech in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. country was the Democratic Republic of the Congo, capital city, Kinshasa. The Lord led me there in a meeting a few years ago. The nation, even at that time, was in the midst of civil war. In one of the bush, outlying bush, it was, I don't know what the problem was, but Women were being gang raped sometimes 50 and 60 times in a row. Forces trying to overthrow the government. You would see all over the city, the capital city of about 4 million people, you would see scores of people walking. Some of them had one arm cut off. Some had both arms. That was one of their methods of interpreting. They would take a razor-sharp machete and cut the arms off. Some women, when they finished raping them, sometimes for hours on end, leaving them in a bloody mess on the floor, they would go get the machete and cut their feet off. Most of them professed Christianity. They were being persecuted because of their faith. And I come there, the city is a mess. It stinks. Open sewers running everywhere. Poverty rampant. And I, 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 when I travel overseas, I like to stay downtown. I like to just walk around and you couldn't do it. You didn't feel safe. The, the smells, the filth. And they were trying to hold on to the country and beat back these forces. They were, they were it's a combination of some Muslims, it's a combination of communists. It, it's just, a, it was a mess. And the first night, Friday night, we're, I'm being driven to the service. And the further we drive, the worse it gets and all of a sudden I begin to hear it was the oddest sound 
It sounded like you've heard generators, that buzz, that noise they make. That's what it sounded like. I thought, there's a lot of generators running around here. Because it was that bzzz that you could hear. Odd sound. And all of a sudden we stopped and they came to open the door and they said, you're going to have to jump because it was a huge, they, the street was just a sewer. And when I opened the door, the sound became louder and louder. And I kept like, what is this sound? I, I, they literally had to help me get over because they were, you know, they didn't want my shoes to get down. I didn't really care. Then they lead me and there's this just big old converted warehouse. And when they opened the door, I found out what the noise were. It was about 5,000 Africans on their knees before the Lord praying. I'm not exaggerating. I stood there transfixed, unable to move as I watched this. I had just stepped out from the most horrible environment of filth and poverty, and yet I come in and it's just an old empty warehouse, huge warehouse. There's, there's no nice seats, there's nothing. And they're on their knees praising the Lord. And I, I didn't move. I couldn't move. I stood there transfixed by what I was seeing and what I was feeling. And finally, they saw me and they came to get me and they brought me to the platform and I'm watching these people. And I mean, they knew how to pray. And after a couple of minutes, I said, man, I'm not going to watch them. I'm going to join them. And I mean, and I, I got on my knees on the platform and I was just praying. And finally, the pastor, one of his aides began to call the people together and he, the pastor leaned over to me and he said, he said, a couple things I want you to know. He said, this is the way it is every service. We have to have a season of prayer because that's the only way most of our people can put food on their table and clothes on their back. They have to pray it down. Yes, yes. yes. They have to pray it down. Yes. And then... He said, and everything you see here, he said, the root of it came from y'all's telecast. Because it was through the telecast I got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we, if you only have a Western view of the church, you have no view at all. Because right now in Nigeria, Christians are being burned to death. That's right, yes. They're being locked in church buildings, the buildings flooded with gasoline. I have seen, these are, most of these were Assembly of God churches. I have talked to the missionaries. I've seen the pictures of the scarred, charred bodies laid out one beside the other. And the last one I saw, what they told me, that went with it, it, just, it just blew my mind. They said, in the midst of the fire, not one person cried out for themselves. They were worshiping the Lord. Worship in the Lord. That's what we need here. We want to, first of all, thank Jason for that word. And secondly, ushers, bring our boxes. We want to bless Jason's ministry. That he. We hope you were blessed and enjoyed.